اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم رب شرح لی صدری و یسر لی امری وحل العقدت من لسانی یفقہ قولی السلام علیکم یہ برادرز و سسٹرز ٹوڈیز ٹاک انشاءاللہ is going to be about how to master our fear and it seems like an appropriate topic because this uh, in this day and age we are seeing a lot of Islamophobia a lot of attacks on Islam and Islamic Sha'ir and anything Islam and the Muslim religion is considered as an open target it's like an open season it's considered it's okay to attack Islam and Muslims and what does it do it creates an environment of intimidation fear people are compelled to sometimes consider okay well should I even announce myself as a Muslim among the public and that's the environment of fear that has been created for the people now in that environment of fear in this environment of Islamophobia the question comes in is it okay to have a fear and if it's okay to, if we have fear then how do we master that how do we go past this fear and then inshallah we're going to talk about what types of fears as a human being we would feel and experience and how to actually deal with it inshallah and we'll look at examples from the seerah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam seerah of the sahaba ikram and we can look at the evidences from the, uh, from the Quran mostly and we will see how inshallah we would be able to master our fear master uh, and control this fear that is being thrusted upon us and inshallah we would be able to uh, distinguish uh, between the haq and batil even in the day and age of Islamophobia and the state of fear that has been inflicted upon us inshallah Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Surah Ali Imran ayah 102 Ya ayu allazine amanu attaqullaha haqqa tuqatihi وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا وَأَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمُونَ Oh believers, fear Allah the way He should be feared. حَقَّ تُقَادِهِ The way He deserves to be feared. What's the, the, the haqq of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be feared? And do not die except in the state of being in submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that who it needs to be feared or only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala needs to be feared and we are seeing in this environment the people are making us afraid of them or the people or the system or the the uh, intelligence agencies or foreign governments or in governments internally externally when we look at it fear as a emotion fear is one of those primal instincts this means that everybody every human being and every living being, I should even say, is, has this instinct of fear. It's one of the primal instincts. We are born with it. It's intrinsic. And we have those two basic emotions, like the fear and hope. And hope and fear is these are the two balancing emotions that are there in the human being that actually helps us with the, uh, with the coping of the environment uh, around us. When we see that the fear, what is it, what it can do? It can incapacitate a human being. It can make somebody freeze in their tracks. Like, I'm afraid I'm not going to be able to move up forward. I cannot do much up because I'm afraid. I'm afraid what's going to happen to me. I'm afraid for my life. I'm afraid for my sustenance. I'm afraid for my job. Or I could be afraid of, for example, my visa status. Somebody might kick me out from this country. I'm afraid because somebody pinned something on me, right? And all these things, somebody may come and actually take my life away. These are some of the basic fears that we all have as a human being. And what we see, what we see that because of this fear, how does it show in people? It shows, it manifests in itself, it shows itself by not practicing Islam completely. We would see that some of the uh, sisters, they are afraid to put the hijab on their head 
Because if they put the hijab on their head, they go out, they would be immediately recognized as Muslim. And they feel afraid that how could they deal with the situation in this Islamophobia environment. Some people are even afraid, even as a man, to pray outside or in open, in public. They consider, okay, well, if I pray, then everybody would know that I'm a Muslim. Some people are even afraid to actually announce themselves that they are Muslim. They don't even want to associate themselves with the Muslims. I was talking to one of the uh, brothers who's a professional, mashallah, and he was talking to me and during his talk, he just shared one piece of information that he did not, he never shared among his co-workers that he's a Muslim. Because he was afraid to share even this fact that he was a Muslim. And because of that, anything Islam, related to Islam or Muslims, he was not associating himself with in public. So this is the situation that we see around us. We also see because of the fear, some Muslims are resorting to spying on other Muslims. They feel it's okay to share their, their secrets or even collaborate with the conspirators and actually do the entrapment uh, schemes. And one of the other manifestations of this fear is that we could also become busy with this life. So, well, dealing with the outside world is too much for me. I'm going to just busy with myself with dunya that I have. I have to do a job, make a living, I have to take care of my family, raise my family, and I'm going to be consumed with all these activities. I'm not going to concern myself with anything related to Islam, especially in public. And what happens that then they would become and put Islam and the Muslims or any activities related to Islam as the last thing on their list of priorities. So if they have 100 priorities, it would be 101. Maybe put in an appendix. And if you don't get to the, 100, the top 100, this means they're not going to get to 101 priority. This means whatever is related to Islam or the Muslim, it will get done the last if it gets done. It's not my priority if I am afraid. When we say that the fear is a human, nature, a human emotion, it's an intrinsic emotion, this means we are born with it. So how are we supposed to deal with this fear? We, we, we kind of reviewed how it could actually incapacitate people. But then how do we master this fear? so that we obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala completely and we fulfill the obligation placed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 100%. So let's look at the examples of our glorious past, the examples of the uh, Sahaba subhanahu wa during the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how did they uh, deal with this emotion? One very good example dealing with fear is the, uh, the Ghazwa of Khandaq, or the Battle of the Trench. Battle of the Trench was when Uhrim al he was one of the Jewish uh, uh, leader. He gathered an army of 10,000 fighters, comprising for, uh, drawn men from the Qatfan, the Quraysh, and other, uh, other tribes. Altogether, there was actually, he was able to amass a 10,000 uh, army. And that army in that area, meaning the, at that time of the Arabian Peninsula, they had not seen this big, big, huge of an army. This was unusual for that time and the place. So they came to take care of Islam for once and for all. They thought this is our chance to take care of this problem that they consider is a thorn in their issue, in their, in their eyesight. And what do we do? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, upon the advice of Salman and Pharisee, he actually digs the trenches and actually is able to uh, get into a stalemate position. They were not able to attack. And he dug the, uh, the trenches from the north. And from the south side, there was Bani Quraida. They were actually one of the allies of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They were part of the, uh, uh, the uh, Medina pact. And they were part, integral part of the defense of the Medina. When you look at the, uh, the power composition, the, the, uh, the Confederates, 
they actually had about 10,000 people, attackers. And Muslimin, all, when you count all the Muslims and all the fighters in the Medina, it was about 3,000. So there were about one to three ratio, which was overwhelming. And on top of that, Rais al Munafiq Abdullah bin Ubay, he finds this opportunity to take himself and his contingent of Munafiqeen and some people who, are, who had weakness in their heart away from Rasulullah on top of that. So now you were already in a weak position and it became much weaker. Now, at the same time, when they were digging the trench, Rasulullah based on the Wahid Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was giving the promises of what? They're seeing there's a huge army coming, marching their way in a week's time. And they are digging the trenches and Rasulullah giving the Wahi and the Bashara the glad tidings of the palaces of the Qasr and Kisra. The palaces in Sham area and the palaces in Iran, the Persian area. These are the huge empires, the superpowers of the day. He was promising Muslimin that you will conquer these things. You will open these one day, not too far away. So this was the, the psychology that Rasulullah was building by the Wahi of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them the boost, the moral boost. And during this time frame, Banu Quraida, who, even, who was living in the south of the Medina, they decided to betray the trust of Rasulullah and started negotiating with the, the Confederates, or with the Quraysh. Uhiyah bin Akhtab managed to convince them to break the treaty with Rasulullah and the Muslimin and to start collaborating with the Confederates. That news obviously was something as a heart uh, that would actually weaken somebody's resolve because you have the armies from the north, you have the, uh, now the enemies from the south. So you're actually being pushed from two sides. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the same situation in Surah Al-Hazab, ayah number uh, 10 to 12. I'm reading the translation of the understanding. When they came upon you from above and from below you, when the eyes grew wild and the hearts reached to the throat, you were harboring doubts about Allah. Their believers were tried and shaken with the mighty shaking. And when the hypocrites and those in whose heart is a disease of doubt said, quote, Allah and His Messenger has promised nothing but delusions, end quote. And when you look at the uh, ayah related to the to Muslimin of the same incident, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَمَّا رَعَى الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الْأَحْسَابَ قَالُوا هَذَا مَا وَعْدَنَا اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَصَدَقَ اللَّهُ وَرَسُولُهُ وَمَا زَادَهُمْ إِلَّا إِيمَانًا وَتَسْلِيمًا Translation. And when the believers saw Al-Ahzab, the Confederates, they said, this is exactly what Allah and His Messengers promised us. And Allah and His Messenger have spoken the truth and only added to their faith and to their submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this situation lasted, did not last for one day or two days, it lasted for a long time. But at the same time, this is actually indicating to us how did the believers took it and how did the munafiqeen took it. The believers said that they have been promised by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that they will be tested. They will be given a mighty shaking. So when they saw the test in front of them, when they saw the people coming and attacking them for the force, they saw that this is exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promised them. And their iman increased. But at the same time with the munafiqun, when the munafiqun saw this, they said, well, looks like my days of pleasure are, are going to be gone. And they are numbered now. So they started feeling doubt in their heart. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala would give a trials like these, where a certain death is, a death is certain, or a, you are facing a mighty enemy in front of you. We will be given a situation like this. And how do we respond to that? We respond to the situation by saying that, yes, this is the wa'ad of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That He will test us. And the test is right in front of us. Now I have to do what? I have to make sure that, that I do 100% of my submission to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So that's the only nija, that's the only deliverance from this situation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala surely, what he does, he helps the Muslimin and sends down the mighty winds, powerful winds, to the Confederates' camps. And we see that we, when we read the history and the seed of Rasulullah the wind was so powerful, it blew away the animals, like the, the, uh, the goats, the cows, whatever they brought for, for their food, even the horses, they were blown away by the, uh, by the wind. Their camps were blown away. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala single-handedly defeated the Ahzab. And this is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivers a mu'mineen. If they place their utmost trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because you had no idea how you're going to be able to overcome the situation. And yet Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala delivered you. And not because of your own doing it, because of Allah's doing. Now I like to take another example from the seat of, uh, from the seat of Sahaba Rasulullah uh, When they migrated to Abyssinia, Habasha, they were facing persecution in Mecca. They were getting beat up, they were even killed, they were boycotted. They had all kinds of trials and tribulations inflicted upon them. How did, we, how did they deal with that? So one of the, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allowed the early Muslimin to go to Habasha, to do Hijrah, for the sake of the deen, to live there in uh, relative uh, security and calmness. So they could actually flee from the persecution for some time. But the people from Makkah, they did not spare them. So they sent a delegation to the king of Habasha, Rajashi, and asked them what, what was the thing that uh, they did. They, when they went to Najashi's court, they started distributing gifts to all the people in the court so that they built a favorable uh, opinion among those people, among the court. And then asked the king to find out for the Muslimin, what did they think about Isa alayhi salam? Because we all know that the Sora believe him, Na'udhu Billah, son, son of the God, right? So they wanted to actually bring up this topic in front of Najashi, so that when they, he, he would hear what Muslimin believe about Isa alayhi salam, he would get repulsed and he may even revoke their security and their, uh, that they, they cannot live there and he would may be handed over, they may be handed over to the Makkah. And they knew that, okay, well, if they go back to uh, Makkah again, in this situation when they were able to actually uh, flee from the persecution, they're going to be severely persecuted again and may even die. So they knew that this is a, a certain, a real, present, clear and present danger in front of them. Now, how do we, how did they uh, deal with this situation? They actually, among themselves, they actually, uh, they actually collaborated, they actually did the, um, the mashwara and they said, well, how should we uh, deal with the situation? They all came to the same conclusion that the only way out of this is to tell the truth and nothing but the truth. So, Jafir bin Dayyar, Rasulullah Anhu, he, comes in front of the Najashi and he tells them, he recites the ayah from Surah Maryam that talks about the, 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 the high uh, position of uh, Azad Maryam alayhi salam and Hazrat Isa alayhi salam and uh, that they are, he is nothing but the, the, um, the son of I Maryam alayhi salam and then he is the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Najashi heard those ayahs from Surah Maryam, he teared up. He said, he is nothing more than what you described. And he said that you can stay here as long as you want. And he turned away the delegation for the Makkah empty-handed back. Now let's think about it for a second. This was a situation where their, uh, their security, their peace, their well-being was at stake. And they had a clear and present danger not just a, a, a preconceived notion of you know, there may be some, uh, some issues, something like that, right? But they saw that, even then they stuck to the truth. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala held them in this situation again. They did not tell the king what he wanted to hear, but they told the king what is the truth. That they did not compromise on the principles of Islam. And that's a key aspect, that's a key takeaway 
from this story as well. So let's remind ourselves of one, one more ayah from Surah Tawbah, ayah number 19. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, telling us, Atakshawnahum, Wallahu ahaqku, antakshawhu in kuntum mu'mineen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says the translation, do you fear them? He's talking about the people. Do you fear them? The people. Nay, it is Allah whom you should more justly fear if you are believers. Right? So only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is deserves to be feared, not the human beings, not the governments, not the secret agencies, not my boss, not my risk. Right? That I may lose my risk. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He gave us these emotions, He also telling us how we should deal with this emotion. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Ya Muslimun, O believers, fear Allah. The way he should be feared. And do not die except in a state of being a Muslim. And why should we fear anybody else? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who has total and absolute control over all of us. He can reward us. He can punish us, both in dunya and in the akhirah. Now what's interesting is that whatever you have in this dunya is temporary. It's for few years. It's not lasting, right? Whether we have a very beautiful life, very cushy life, comfortable life, it's gonna end. Whether we have a hard life, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect from us, but even if he gives us a hard life, it's going to be for a few days. And then it's going to be over. And on the day of judgment, we're going to go back to him and he would judge upon how well we behave, or how well we obeyed his commandments. And based on that, it would be a permanent punishment or permanent reward. <coughs> So no matter how much people have in this dunya, whether reward-wise or the punishment-wise, they will die one day. But in the akhirah, there is no death. If somebody is getting punished, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran that when the, uh, the, uh, the, the fire burns through the skin, because the skin is where you actually feel the pain, any pain. Skin is, has the most sensitive number of uh, sensors that actually gives you the pain. When the skin gets roasted through because of the, the fire, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will replace with a new skin. So there's a continuous punishment. A continuous punishment that does not end. So there is no way that it's going to go away. When he reminds us about the punishment, he also reminds us about the bountiful rewards that Allah subhanahu wa has prepared for the Mu'mineen. And these rewards cannot be matched. For example, Allah subhanahu wa is telling us that the, the lowest level in the Jannah, because the Jannah has so many levels, the lowest level in the Jannah, this is for the, the weakest of the Muslim. It is as wide as the heavens and the earth. Now just let your imagination go wild here. Think about yourself that you are the only person and the owner of a place which is as big as the dunya and, and, uh, and, the, uh, and the heavens. So you are the only one controlling the entire universe that you see in front of you. We feel happy we get 3,000 square feet home. MashaAllah, I made it big. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling you, you will give, be given the whole earth. And this is the lowest level. And this is the lowest level of the Jannah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said in the Quran that anybody who who's gets saved from the fire and enters into the Jannah, into the lowest level, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said this is the Fawzul, Kabir, Fawzul Azim. This is the, the biggest success to be entering into the Jannah. And the beauty of those rewards in the Jannah is that there is no end 
there is no fear. There is no uh, jealousy. There is no um, any negative emotions that you have. They are not, none of those are there. There is no term limit. There is no sorrow. There is no sadness. There is no hatred. And there will be no fear as well. All you are there for is to enjoy for what you did in the dunya. Now, just think about, look at some of those fears that we have, like the fear of the death. People would threaten us, of the Muslimin, that okay, well, if you don't obey them, meaning the human beings, and disobey the Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then somehow they will do something to our life. Maybe they will kill us. Okay. Well, let's look at the, the fear of death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about uh, the fear, um, uh, the, the death. And he says that even though all of us have this fear, because as a human being or as, as a living being, we all have this instinct that we want actually survival instinct, that we want to protect ourselves. But it does not mean that we should be consumed by it that we cannot actually think about anything else other than this, the fear of death. We all know that the life here in this, in this dunya is temporary, and it will end, but it can only end by the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is the aqeedah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches us, this is part of the aqeedah. Death occurs only by the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and no one he knows when his or her appointed time is going to be. And nobody can add a second more, nobody can remove a second more from my appointed term. This means if somebody is threatening me with for life to kill me, something like that, I should not fear that because they cannot add my life or they cannot remove anything from my life. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Araf, ayah number 34, ummatin ajalun, fa ajaluhum la sa'atan to every people is that a term appointed. When the term is reached, not a moment can they cause a delay, not a moment can they advance in anticipation. So it's clear for us. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly says that I should not be worried about my life. And it is the part of the aqeedah. That I ha as a Muslim, I have to have this aqeedah that nobody can increase or decrease my life term. Okay? Another fear that we have all is about what if I lose my job? What happens if they take away my house, my business? Right? What I'm going to be doing? How I'm going to live my life in this dunya? The fear for the rest, or the provisions. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Surah Saba, ayah number 39, قُلْ إِنَّ رَبِّي يَبْسُطُ رِزْقَ بِمَنْ يَشَاءُ مِنْ إِبَادِهِ وَيَقْضِرُ لَهُ وَمَا أَنْفَقْتُمْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ فَهُوَ يُخْلِفُهُ وَهُوَ خَيْرُ الْغَازِقِينَ O Prophet said to them, My Lord gives abundantly to whomever of his servant he wills, and sparingly to whom he wills. Whatever you spend, he replenishes it by other provisions. He is the best of the providers. In another place in, Allah, in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Wallahu khayru raziqeen, that he is the best of the providers. Now, <clears throat> we should remind ourselves that it's not our business that is giving us the rest. It's not our job that is giving us the rest. It's not my boss that is giving me the rest. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving me the rest. And this is not just the money. And this is another misconception that we have. Risk is not just the money. Risk is anything that I use. The food I eat, the drinks I drink, the clothes I wear, the, the, the cars I use, the houses I live in. This is all, anything in this dunya, this is part of my risk. It's not the money. The money is not the risk. It's whatever I use for myself, that becomes a risk for me. So, Risk and Ajal, meaning my sustenance and my time period, my life period, is only controlled by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No human being can touch that. Nobody can increase it or decrease it. Another fear that we have is that 
a calamity may befall. Na'udzubillah. Something bad may happen to us. Or people are, are, are threatening. Okay, well, if you, if you follow Islam, then something bad is going to happen. Right? Your business could be shut down. Your business could decline. <coughs> people can do something harm to your, your place of business or your, your, your residence and things like that. Man, remind ourselves by Quran in Surah Al Hadid, ayah number 22, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, Ma asaba min musibatin fal ardi, wala fi anfusikum, illa fi kitabin, min qabli, anna barraha, inna zalig Allah yaseer. Translation No misfortune can happen on earth or in your souls, but is recorded in a decree before. We bring it into existence that is truly easy for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So he's saying that this is everything we determined. So whatever calamity is destined for you is all written by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he will bring it if he wants it to. Right? So no human being has control over that. And the ayah. <clears throat> In Surah Al Imran, ayah number 160, قُلْ لَنْ يُسِيبَنَا إِلَّا مَا كَتَبَ اللَّهُ لَنَا هُوَ مَغْنَانَا وَلَا اللَّهِ فَلْيَتَوَكِّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Surah Tawbah, ayah number 51, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that, say nothing will happen to us except what Allah has decreed for us. He is our protector, مَغْنَانَا. He is our protector and in Him let the believers put their trust. وَعَلَى اللَّهِ فَلْيَدَوَكِّلِ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ Only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who is sufficient for all of us. And we should have replaced our trust in Him. That he is the best disposer of our affairs for us. And He is the only one who controls everything for us. And if He wants, he can, nobody else can harm us. And if he, if he wants to reward us, then nobody can stop us. In another ayah, Surah Al-Imran, ayah number 160, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'm uh, talking about uh, reading the translation, if Allah helps you, none can overcome you. If he forsakes you, who is there after that that can help you? In Allah, let, uh, let believers put their trust. al Imran, ayah 160. So if he wants to help us, nobody can stop. At the same time, if he forsakes us, if he leaves alone for the enemies to come and take care of us and to punish us, then nobody can stop his punishment. So, what does it mean? This means that I have to always put trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and have to my, continue my obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, do exactly what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling me and keep the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I should not fear that somebody a, a human being, a government agency, or a, what have you, can actually come and threaten me for something bad happening to me or to my family. Because why? Because only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala controls that. I should have the trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I should have tawakkul in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At the same time, I have to make sure that I am 100% obeying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because that's the only help that I can get. That's where I need to put my trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, as a Muslim, we're not allowed to divide Islam and assign priorities to Islam. Okay, well, maybe I can do some of these ahkam of Islam, which are easy for me. Maybe I can pray, I can fast, do hajj, zakah, or do other, be nice to other people. But when it comes to <clears throat> the other ahkam, which deals with the society, it deals with the economics, it deals with the, the ruling system, it deals with the social system, right? It deals with the judiciary. I tend to have cold feet. So, well, that's maybe too big for me. Maybe I cannot handle that. And why I'm saying that? Because I have a fear of the people or the environment around me. I am feeling that, okay, well, maybe I am not ready for this. Or maybe what will the people think about it? How the people would perceive about it? How the foreign governments would think about it? How would the kuffar think about it? 
Or maybe the environment is not right to talk about these things. These all thoughts could come to my mind. Right? <clears throat> now, look at this, what the Sahaba did. When they entered Islam, they followed Islam completely and comprehensively. They did not pick and choose, okay, well, this is easy for me, I'll do it. This is hard, I'm going to actually push it off to, the, to some, some other time, some better days. I don't know when, when the better days are going to become, because I don't even know I'm going to be, live long enough to see those better days. Right? Because Ajal is in the hands of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I cannot just try to be a good Muslim by morals, or just by focusing on rituals. I cannot just say that I have to build my Iman and be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, commands only selectively. The way Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying they establish the salah, it's the same thing as saying giving the zakah. But all the establishing the law of the qisas, the law of retribution. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about and gives the punishment for the, the uh, for uh, for stealing, qatayyad, this is chopping the hand off of the thief, if it, beyond the nasab, that also is the hukum of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that I have to be truthful, I also mean, uh, he's also actually giving me the ahkam for collection of tax. He's also giving me the ahkam for um, the establishing the khilafah. He's also giving me the ahkam for uh, how I should be dealing with the Ushri land. How I should be dealing with uh, establishing the justice of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on the face of the earth. It's all commands that uh, are equally applicable for me. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to hold us accountable on their judgment for the salah, the zakah, the hajj, the siyam. He was also going to hold us accountable for the, all the other ahkam. So we have to think about it. How are we going to face the accounting of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? When he's going to ask us about those ahkam. I cannot pick and choose myself. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that in the Quran, anybody who picks and chooses, just listen to this ayah. This is this is very very um, powerful ayah. That it's a great reminder for all of us. Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says in Surah Baqarah, ayah number eighty-five: "Afa tu'minuna bil bad al kitabi wa takfurun bi bad, fa ma jazaa ma yafalu zalika minkum illa khizyun fil hayat al dunya wa yom al qiyama yuradun ila ashad al azabi, ama Allah bi ghafil amma ta'malun." أولئك الذين اشتروا الحياة الدنيا بالآخرة فلا يخفف عنهم الأزاب ولهم ينصرون. Do you believe in a part of the book and reject the rest? Then what is the recompense of those who do so among you, except humiliation in this life, and on their resurrection they will be consigned to the most grievous punishment? Allah is aware of what you do. Such are those who purchase the life of this dunya, this world, at the price of the hereafter. Their punishment will not be lightened, nor will they be helped. This is a very good reminder for all of us that I cannot pick and choose myself. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one who can set the priorities for me. I cannot do that because of my fear, my convenience, or the environment is not right, whatever situation may be. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that anybody who does that, there will be humiliation for them in this dunya. And one of the most grievous punishment in the hereafter. And their punishment is not going to get less over the period of time. And nobody's going to help them. So this is a good reminder for me. I cannot just pick and choose. I cannot just do something that, that is convenient for me, that's easier for me. Having said all that, we also have to be, be very prudent and smart about understanding why we are in a situation, that why this environment is being created for us. Why are we being put in defensive mode? That being Muslim or talk, taking the name of Islam even that becomes challenge. 
And why are we encouraging being coerced and encouraged into compromising on Islam? Islam, we all know, is a comprehensive ideology. It provides rules and regulations for all aspects of our life. And we are, ex we are encouraged and coerced to accept ideas that are foreign to Islam. One of the ideas that is being attacked ferociously and derisively is that the idea of uniting all the Muslims under one banner, under one state, creating the Khilafah state, and effectively defaming the Islamic duty of having a single state for all the Muslims. Because of this fear, Muslims are on defensive. Some people are even finding it difficult to identify themselves as Muslims and practice Islam openly. In this environment, you would see people making calls to make Islam more moderate, more tolerant, more adaptable, more to go along with the times that we are facing right now. And when we see that, why this is thing, this is, there is actually a concerted effort going on there. I just want to remind ourselves about the, the policy paper that was written by a brand corporation not too long ago. They identified, they, they classified Muslims into four categories. And one of the categories they said the Muslims that they should be encouraged, the nurtured, developed, and supported elements within the Muslims who will take up the charge of modernizing Islam, who would actually walk away from the other obligation of Islam, make Islam more tolerant, more adaptable, more along the lines of the, the call of the time that we, we live in at the moment. Na'uzu billah, that's just, they giving the impression, na'uzu billah, that Islam is somehow needs reformation. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, billah, did not knew that 2016 would happen, that people would live in the U.S. Na'uzu billah, he is alim, he is khabir. For him, there is no past, present, and future. For him, everything has happened. He is complete in his knowledge. He is al alim he, is, he, he has the most amount of knowledge that anybody can have. And he's a khabir, he's khabir. He knows everything. So, all these calls for reformation, adaptation, and make secularizing Islam, or making the American fiqh, all these calls are nothing but the call of the shaitan. The calls of created by the kuffar, and they are using the elements within the Muslims to pursue their agenda. We need to remind ourselves that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has completed this deen. They have, he has perfected this deen. What does perfection mean? Nothing can be added, nothing can be removed. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Ma'idah, ayah number three, Al-yawm akmaltu lakum deenukum, wa atmamtu alaykum ni'mati, Today I have perfected your deen, completed my favors on you, and have chosen Islam as your way of life. So there is no changes to Islam that are allowed. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us as a perfect deen. And he has completed his favor. He did not forget something. He completely knew, absolutely knew that 2016 would come and we will, people will be living in U.S. in this minority situation. So we should not delude ourselves, we should not actually um, deceive ourselves about this. Now let's look at this, that for the past hundred years, what have not the Muslims done? We have tried all types of solutions, accept Islam. We have tried nationalism, tried socialism, capitalism, Democracy, dictatorship, monarchy, kingship, and all these attempts have failed. We still are in abject poverty. We still are being held in humiliation. And this is kind of a, a ironic when you look at the, the situation on the ground. The Muslims are not num a few numbers. They are more than 1.5 billion. 
When you look at their material situation, they have, mashallah, one of the uh, largest amount of resources. They have oil, they have gas, they have land mass, they have fertile land, they have people, they have everything. So why aren't we moving? But at the same time, we see the, the, the maximum number of people in abject poverty and humiliation are among the Muslims. These are true contradictions we see. You have all the wealth Allah subhanahu wa could possibly give you, and you also see this abject poverty and humiliation. Why? Because we, for the past hundred years, we have not been implementing Islam completely. And if we do that, <coughs> and if we have been doing this, and we should actually stop and think about it. Has not the time come to adopt the solutions from the creator of the world? Rather than in, uh, copying and making imitation of the kuffar. We need to follow the sunnah of uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We have been encouraged not to follow the sunnah al-Yahud, or sunnah al-Nasara. We all recite surah al-Fatiha in every salah, in every rakah. And what do we say? Aidina al-Sirat al-Mustaqeem, Sirat al-Lazina an-anta alayhim, ghayr al-Maghdubi alayhim wa al-Dhaleen. Ameen. So we are, we are being reminded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we should not be following the path of the Yehud and Nasara. So we need to start discussing these ideas, that we need to accept only things that are coming from the primary source of Islam, which is the Quran and the Sunnah. We have to start rejecting ideas that are foreign to Islam, and they, are, they have no basis from the Quran and Sunnah. And sometimes people cloak them under the uh, Islam. They use the green varnish to give the kufr idea Islamic presence. We need to be smart about that. We need to be able to tell it apart. Because we need to understand that, that if we don't obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if we don't completely follow the way of Islam, the uh, way of life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed to us, then it will not be accepted. So Ali Imran, ayah number 85, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا يَبْتَغِ غَيْرَ الْإِسْلَامِ دِينًا فَلَا يُقْبَلَ مِنْهُ وَهُوَ فِي الْآخِرَةِ مِنَ الْخَاسِرِينَ And whosoever seeks a way of life other than Islam will find that it will not be accepted from him. In the hereafter, he will be among the losers. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Baqarah, ayah number 208, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا تْخُولُوا فِي السِّلْمِ كَأَفَّةِ وَلَا تَتَّبِيُوا قُطُوَاتِ الشَّيْطَانِ إِنَّهُ لَكُمْ مُبِينٍ Enter into the fall of Islam completely and follow not the footsteps of shaitan. So whether we are in a state of fear or ease, we need to work to establish Islam as the only way of life for all of us and for the entire humanity. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, this is where I'm going to stop inshaAllah. In Surah Tawbah, أَتَقْ شَوْنَهُ وَاللَّهُ أَحَقُّ أَن تَخْشَوْهُ إِن كُنْتُمْ مُؤْمِنِينَ do you fear them? Nay, it is Allah whom you more justly fear if you are believers.